Consider a simple physical system of two large masses, say the Earth and the Moon, or the Earth and the Sun, alone in a void. Given a few variables, the masses of the objects, their relative positions, and their relative velocities, can one reasonably predict the path each object travels through space, given their mutual gravitation? Here we aim to answer that question and take the crucial first step towards understanding how we plot courses traversing the cosmos. So, what do these trajectories look like? Can one predict the object's positions and velocities at any arbitrary point in time, tf, given those variables, at ti? In glancing at this two-body system of equally massive bodies, it would certainly appear so. But what happens when a third mass is added to the system? How about another? It turns out that our intuition about the two-body example was correct, and such trajectories are determinable. On the other hand, barring contrived special cases, the in-body problem cannot be solved. Of course, our universe is a bit more complex than two point particles gravitationally tugging at one another. And considering our modern understanding of general relativity, gravitation, and the notion that every massive thing is attracted to every other massive thing, it would be easy to assume that a stable system, such as our solar system, or even a subset of it, say the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun, is overwhelmingly complicated. However, Considering simple models like the Earth and the Moon alone can provide great insight into how celestial systems tick, and these models can even provide a fantastic first step in calculating the orbits, say the Moon's, given the Sun's gravitational influence alongside the Earth's, and more complicated systems, by means of something known as perturbation theory. The following series will be roughly split into four parts spanning two videos, where we'll delve into the two-body problem. In part 1, we'll describe the geometric model for two-body trajectories. In part 2, we'll explore how to relate an object's state vectors, position and velocity, to these orbital elements. In part 3, we'll derive an equation that intrinsically relates an orbital position at some time t initial to another position at arbitrary time t final. And lastly, in part 4, we'll highlight a straightforward computational model that accepts state vectors at that initial time and yields new state vectors at any other time, past or future. First things first, the geometric model. The beauty of a two-body problem is that it's solvable, and we can describe orbits as simple geometries expressed as simple equations. These trajectories can be described as one of four conic sections, or conics. Such curves are formed by slicing a right circular cone with a 2D plane. Depending on the angle of that plane, a conic, and our orbit, is either a circle, an ellipse, a parabola, or a hyperbola. Given a few simple variables, the semi-major axis, semi-minor axis, and eccentricity, a general equation for conics can be easily expressed in polar coordinates. It's a simple exercise to apply Newton's law of universal gravitation to our relative position expression, consider conservation of energy and conservation of angular momentum, and derive the following expression, but that will have to be left to the viewer. Another convenient aspect of a two-body system is that it can be yet further reduced to a pair of so-called one-body problems, with each object's trajectory described relative to the system's barycenter, or center of mass. In many situations, it's common to utilize the central force approximation, where we consider the larger of our two masses as an immobile source of a force acting on the smaller body. And such a simplification is often reasonable. For example, the Earth-Moon barycenter is about 1,700 kilometers beneath the surface of the Earth. As another example, the Earth-Sun barycenter is only 449 kilometers from the Sun's center. That's less than 0.07% of the Sun's radius. When considering the trajectories of artificial objects, man-made satellites and vehicles, the ratio of our system's masses is even more minuscule, so the remainder of this video will focus on the central force approximation. 
This model is well in the wheelhouse of Johannes Kepler, well known for his three laws of planetary motion. Given his observationally rooted laws, he pondered that very question we originally stated. Given mass, relative position, and relative velocity, can one define a trajectory? That question is the subject of what we call the Kepler problem, and the answer to it, well, is yes. Of course, only approximately, given our modern understanding, but I again insist this is no meaningless exercise, and I hope to convince you that this model can be extended to more complex physical systems, with the likes, for instance, of multiple planets and gravitational slingshots reasonably well. So what exactly are we solving? How is a trajectory defined? As mentioned, an orbit is one of four conic sections, meaning a trajectory exists solely on a 2D plane. Using the Keplerian model, it can be described by just six variables that we call the orbital elements. We'll focus on the ellipse here, though know that these elements are applicable to the other conics, just with perhaps less intuitive geometric meaning. At a high level, the semi-major axis and eccentricity define the size and shape of an orbit. The argument of periapsis, inclination, and the longitude of the ascending node together describe the orientation of our 2D orbital plane in 3D space. And lastly, the true anomaly expresses the object's position along a trajectory. Here I've built a simple model in 3JS, a JavaScript library and API, with which we'll illustrate these elements. Please feel free to play around in the sandbox yourself. Our reference plane is illustrated by the checkerboard pattern, while our coordinate systems X, Y, and Z axes are shown in red, green, and blue, respectively. By Kepler's first law, a planet, the cyan sphere here, orbits the Sun, the yellow sphere, with the Sun positioned at a focus of an ellipse. That ellipse, our trajectory, is illustrated in cyan as well. Adjusting the semi-major axis simply scales our trajectory. Eccentricity dictates our trajectory's type of conic and how elongated it is. While I only illustrate ellipses in the sandbox, know that when E is greater than 1, a trajectory is considered hyperbolic, when E is precisely 1, parabolic, and when E decreases from 1 towards 0, we get decreasingly elongated ellipses and eventually a perfect circle at E equals 0. The next three variables describe the orientation of this orbital plane. We see here that the trajectory is at an angle relative to the reference plane. This angle is called the inclination. Next, consider the point where our trajectory emerges from below the reference plane. That location is called the ascending node, and the magenta vector here points in its direction. The longitude of the ascending node is the angle between this magenta vector and the reference direction, the x-axis shown in red here. The argument of the periapsis is the angle between our traveling body's ascending node to its periapsis, the point in its orbit at which it's nearest to the primary body. The white line here is drawn between the primary body and this point. At long last, we need to know where our object is along its trajectory. This can be most easily described by the angle between the direction of periapsis and the current position of the body along its path. We call this angle the true anomaly. From here, we'll move on to solving for these elements, given our initial relative position and velocity. As it turns out, determining our orbital elements is a relatively straightforward process, and we begin by calculating the specific relative angular momentum, which is simply the angular momentum per mass, determined by crossing position with velocity. This vector is perpendicular to our 2D orbital plane and constant in time for a satellite, barring some external force, which can be easily shown by crossing the differential equation for relative motion alluded to in part one. Now consider the specific mechanical energy of our satellite. This is simply the sum of its kinetic and potential energy per unit mass, which we know must also be constant in time to conserve energy. With these two constants, we can begin to solve for our orbital elements. First, eccentricity, which requires a brief tangent. 
In introducing conic sections in part 1, I skipped over the orbital position derivation, a process involving crossing our equation of motion with specific angular momentum, h, and integrating in time, which is where the b variable showed up as a vector constant of integration. By equating the derived position equation to the conic equation, we can see that b is simply the eccentricity vector multiplied by the gravitational parameter. Considering our original integration result, we can express eccentricity as a vector with direction pointing towards periapsis and magnitude equivalent to the scalar eccentricity. Here we see the first term with the white vector, the second term with the cyan vector, and the resulting eccentricity vector is green. To acquire the semi-major axis, we can relate our specific energy and momentum equations to our conic geometry. Again, upon comparing our orbital position and conic equations, we see that the semi-lattice rectum is equivalent to the square of h by the gravitational parameter. Written another way, using our semi-lattice rectum definition, h squared is equivalent to the following. By now considering our energy equation at periapsis in terms of h, where rp is the semi-major axis by 1 minus e, we can sub in our h squared expression to arrive at the following equation. Compactly, specific mechanical energy is equivalent to the negative of the gravitational parameter divided by 2 times the semi-major axis, which holds for all conic sections. Here we can of course solve for a, our semi-major axis. The next three elements put up less of a fight. Remembering that h is perpendicular to our orbital plane, inclination is simply the arc cosine of the z component of h divided by the magnitude of h. The longitude of the ascending node, again that position where our trajectory emerges from beneath our reference plane, can be solved for by crossing our reference direction, the x-axis, with h, yielding the vector n, the direction of the ascending node. From there, our longitude is the arc cosine of nx divided by the magnitude of n. If ny is negative, we consider the longitude as 2 pi minus this calculation. Recalling that the argument of periapsis is the angle between the direction of the ascending node to the trajectory's periapsis, one can use the definition of the vector dot product to acquire our angle by dotting n and e. If the z component of our eccentricity vector is negative, we consider the argument as 2 pi minus this calculation. In a stable orbit with no external forces, like a rocket burn for instance, these first five of our orbital elements remain constant, and our trajectory's path is fixed in space. So if one were interested in predicting a satellite's position and velocity on orbit over time, these variables need only be calculated once. The true anomaly, however, which indicates where along the path our satellite is, of course updates over time. Given the state vectors, we can again employ the dot product, this time between the eccentricity vector and the position vector, to acquire the true anomaly, thus completely defining our orbit at a single point in time. But what about predicting past or future states? Ultimately, embedded in the true anomaly is the relationship between the current state vectors at time t initial, a second pair of state vectors at time t final, and the delta time between them. This is the focus of part 3, the Kepler equation. I hope you enjoyed parts 1 and 2. Keep on the lookout for the follow-up video in which we'll derive the Kepler equation and develop a computational model allowing one to predict the past or future state vectors for a mass and a two-body problem.